I know that these these um these conversations can go deep. <laughs> it's hard it's hard actually to I guess I'll just practice holding it up like this. Yeah. It's hard actually to um talk about these subjects in just an hour. Yeah, one well, yeah, you definitely. Can only scratch the surface in about an hour. Yeah, definitely. And that's why as well with some of the things that I've because like I said earlier, we I had you on the podcast last time when we last previous had the conversation we i remember in that conversation we talked about what happens after we die we talked about the larger picture of consciousness and everything but in this podcast conversation i really wanted to sort of try and because i i have sort of looked into a lot of your material and i've been a sort of a um, admirer of your research because you are sort of a legend in the field of the exploration of consciousness and i've really wanted to sort of try and scrape the surface of questions that you hadn't haven't really sort of which I haven't really come across that you've really s- spoke about before so I want to try and scrape the surface a bit more mm-hmm. um, but just to start this as well which is interesting because it was I think it was uh, two years ago we last had you on the podcast where we were just doing Skype conversations and um, I can remember then when you were talking and bringing these theories of consciousness and talking about the simulation theory these conversations weren't really happening in the mainstream i mean and now looking around we have people like elon musk we have full, uh, f- top physicists around the world we have ted talks people all over the world now are actually are now comprehending that your theories what you talked about and many others talked about for a long time that this very much could be a possibility but what's interest interesting to me is is a lot of people are going there but they're not willing to ask the bigger questions behind that and the questions like, who, okay, if this is a simulation, who is the programmer? Who programmed it? Why do you think people are not willing to engage in that part of the conversation yet? Okay. Because every you know, everyone here, I should say everyone, but most people here, grow up with a belief in materialism. I don't mean that in any philosophical sense, but they just grow up understanding that this is a physical world and there's physical causality, and that's the only thing they know. So I call that a cultural belief. That's a belief you get just because it's part of your culture, it's part of your experience. So when you get to the point of realizing that this is a virtual reality, and Many scientists have come to that conclusion. I'd say it's about time. Uh, you know, quantum mechanics, the very or- begin- beginnings of it, started around an experiment called the double slit experiment. And that experiment very clearly says this is not a physical reality. It's not, it's, it's not matter-based because that experiment just defies um, all the things that a an experiment would have to be in order to be have a physical causality. There is no physical causality. So that was in the early 1900s, like 1915 to 1925 in, in that era. So it's been almost 100 years that scientists have known that this isn't a physical reality. It's a probabilistic reality. Particles aren't really particles. They're only potential particles until the measurement is made. So that's been around, but physicists just didn't know what to do with that. So it's just been weird science. We don't know how that works. It's just really strange science. And they haven't had any ideas about what to do with that information or how to couch it or how to make science out of it until recently where we've had computers Computers have given us simulations. Simulations have now given us virtual realities. So in that sense, we've just recently gotten the the vocabulary and the concepts to be able to deal with this, con- you know, with this idea. So before, we had Einstein sitting around saying, I know it has something to do with consciousness, but I don't know what to do with that information. You know, I don't know how to compute it or what math I should use. I don't have any of the elementary concepts to deal with it. So now we do. And uh, the virtual reality concept is one where 
Um, we, our bodies, are the avatars. Consciousness is the player. Okay? And the player cannot be in the same reality as the avatar. The player has to be some other reality. Uh, physicist Edward Fredkin said, other. You know, we're here and the computer that computes this virtual reality must be in other, which means anywhere other than here. Yeah. Because logically, you can't have a computer inside the reality that it's computing. That just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So that is, you know, the concept of virtual reality. But the people have trouble with it can't get past the idea that it needs to have some sort of physical causality. Okay, So as it turns out, this virtual reality or, or uh, simulation that we're in is not programmed. It's evolved. It started with uh, initial conditions and a rule set, and it's just evolved. So there is no programmer that programmed it, like our virtual realities are programmed. World of Warcraft, every tree, every rock, every monster, everything is programmed. But this reality just evolved to be the way it was. And then consciousness has, if you will, logged on to play those characters, those avatars that suited its purpose. So people who, who want to maintain the idea of physical causality only have really one or two ways to do that. One of them is, well, this virtual reality has been programmed by our future selves, okay? Humanity in the future, or maybe humanity uh, that's been around longer than us, maybe even aliens, you know, who uh, are in an older part of the universe who have gotten a lot smarter with a lot more technology than we have. So something like that, but that's physical. You see, it's just another part of the physical paradigm, and now it's creating us, which is another part of their physical paradigm. So in that way, they maintain their, their idea that this is all part of a stream of physical causality. There's some physical beings somewhere who have programmed this virtual reality that we are playing in, and we are conscious characters. So they've programmed consciousness in to each player. Well, that has a lot of things that are just hard to explain. One is how do you program consciousness into a player? That's called the hard problem. Yeah. And scientists have been working on that issue for a long, long time and with no progress whatsoever. There is no uh, idea just yet about how that could possibly come about. But since that would be technology that's far, far advanced of our own, you can just kind of wave your hand at that yeah. and say, well, somehow they've solved that problem, yeah. you know, and they've done that. So that's why we have Elon Musk and others. Uh, it started with a, an Englishman. Um, uh, Nick Bostrom. Yeah, Nick Bostrom started that um, probably early 2000s, you know, 2001 or two, somewhere in that neighborhood, just a little bit before I published my books. You know, and uh, he had that same, you know, he got to that same issue. Okay, his logic took him to the point that it's very likely that we're part of a virtual reality. And then, well, who's the programmer? Well, who could it be? Yeah. You know, aliens just sounds too woo-woo. Nobody's going to believe that, yeah. right? That's kind of silly. So our future selves, well, that's... You know, that's a little hard to believe as well. But Elon Musk picked up Nick Bostrom's viewpoint and has made it popular. Right now, if you tell somebody that, we're, that we are a virtual reality and that this body of ours is just an avatar and that this table doesn't really exist, they'll go nonsense. Yeah. That's silly. Of course it exists. This couldn't be a virtual reality. It's too real for that. But two decades from now, that's not going to be such a hard thing to come to terms with. Now it seems ridiculous, just wild uh, conceptually. But the tools are coming for us to experience virtual reality. Yeah. Not quite as fine as this one, but enough that when you put on that headgear and you get on that platform that moves and shakes and tilts and does all those other things 
it's really hard to tell that you're not in a physical reality. It is really, really real feeling. And it's easy then to kind of see that this could be real feeling and still be a virtual reality. So though it's a tough sell right now, I think it'll be a real easy sell in the near future. People will say, virtual reality? Yeah, makes sense. This yeah. could be a virtual reality. Yeah, definitely. So we're getting to that point where we don't have to come up with physical excuses. We can just say we're consciousness and we are playing an avatar. We make all the choices for that avatar. And there's a purpose for that. We have a purpose for being here. And the purpose is we make choices. And by those choices, we evolve or de-evolve with the quality of our consciousness. So we've this is a virtual reality game, and there is a way to win it and a way to lose it, you see. So that all kind of pulls together. Then consciousness is something outside of this physical reality, non-physical to us. And that's who we really are. We're not the body. We're the consciousness making the choices. Just like you might be the player in a Sims game, yeah. and you as a player in a Sims game make all the choices for your Sims character. It's a similar sort of thing. Yeah. So just, just to jump in as well. So like you said before, your theory is that consciousness is constantly evolving. A question that I've, I've asked myself on many different times is, is, are we part of a larger consciousness? Like you, Tom Campbell, me, Dan Harrison, are we of the same thing, the same consciousness? Or do we, in this simulation, do we have our own individual consciousnesses? Well, all of the above. Okay, okay yes. We are a part of it. Uh, what I call the larger consciousness system is the source. And we're a piece of that. We're a piece of that system. Mm. And as we evolve the quality of our individual consciousness, because our individual consciousness is a part of this larger consciousness, we help the larger system evolve as well. So one way of looking at it is we are the larger conscious system strategy for evolving because we're, we're it, it's us. On the other hand, we also are individual in the sense that, you know, you are Dan, I am Tom, yeah. and we have our own history that's very different. We have a unique set of experiences and that unique set of experiences is captured in information. Consciousness is just an information system. So our uniqueness is, comp is captured in the information of the system of which we're part. So yes, we are part of the whole. We're also individual, just like our body. Okay. I've got a, a left arm or a right arm. You know, I got pieces. And in a way, they do their own thing. You know, they type, they reach out, they grab things or whatever, and they don't particularly communicate with my toes, you know, or with my insides or anything else. <laughs> they do their own sort of thing. They've got their own mission, right, which is to get hold of things, be able to manipulate things in this environment. So that's what they do. But they're still part of something bigger because this arm just doesn't exist by itself. It's just an arm by itself doesn't can't do anything useful it only is is you know it only can fulfill its purpose as being a part of a whole yeah. so we're kind of the same thing we're a piece of this system but we're still individual the arm is still an arm it's not the whole it's just a part of the whole but yet it's a part of the thing we call a human being yeah i love that by the way and another question i really wanted to ask you as well and like you said before that one of your theories is that consciousness has sort of created this realm for its own discovery, uh, for discovery of consciousness. Um, if that is the case and consciousness has created a realm to evolve its own self, a question I had on top of that was, why do you think we, within that being said, why do we still have the ability to sort of transcend our own individual consciousnesses in other realms so things like the out of body experience which i know you experienced lucid dream realms even people talk about psychedelics as well so why do you think we have the ability within this simulation to actually transcend our consciousness in other realms okay because we are conscious and that's why everyone you know everyone is a consciousness and we're all playing avatars here but because we're conscious we can explore all that is consciousness. We have all the abilities and all of the connections 
to explore all of consciousness because that's what we are. So we are logged on to this avatar and we're logged on in such a way that we only bring our quality of consciousness to that new avatar. So because we don't bring any intellectual component with us, we just bring our quality of consciousness, that avatar's experience is the only experience that we can remember. It's the only experience we think we have. So we identify as the avatar. We think we are the avatar, but we're not. We're really consciousness. And consciousness has some interesting attributes. One, all consciousness is netted. So anything that's conscious can be connected to by anything else that's conscious. So we call that telepathy when it's between, you know, person to person or person to dog or whatever else. You know, we, uh, well, how do we say that uh, in New Age talk? Uh, getting good vibes, right? Yeah, yeah, or bad yeah. vibes. That's us really getting data from each other. So we have that. Plus, we now are, are getting this reality. When I say we log on, that means we get a data stream from the server that's serving up this game, from the computer. Now, the computer is part of consciousness. Consciousness is an information system. So part of it, it can reconfigure itself as a computer. It can configure itself as us, uh, individuated unit of consciousness. So we get a data stream, and we interpret that data to be this reality, exactly the same as any virtual reality works. In a virtual reality, you get a data stream. Yeah. And you interpret that data stream to be you know, that virtual reality. So all we have to do in order to get in some other reality is just get some other data stream. So if we can get the system, the server, or any part of the larger conscious system to send us a data stream, then that is another reality. When we dream, we just get a different data stream that we can interpret differently because the rule set in the dream world is a lot softer rule sets. It's got a lot, you know, there's a lot uh, fewer constraints. So in a dream, you can teleport or fly or, you know, change instantly from one thing to another, whereas in this reality, the rule sets won't let you do that. But uh, you have an out-of-body reality, which is really just a single-player game with the larger consciousness system. So you're getting a data stream from that system, that system sends you that data stream in order to help you see a bigger picture. It's a growing thing, just like the dreams. We grow, we, we get valuable choices in a dream, and we get valuable choices in an out-of-body state. But because those environments are different, and those rule sets are different, there's a whole different set of choices we have there. So in a dream state, you have a lot of things happening to you that won't happen to you here, you know, and that gives you choices that you don't have here. So it's another learning place to make choices and evolve or de-evolve in the out-of-body states like that too. It's another virtual reality that allows us to make choices and by those choices evolve or de-evolve. So it's just another reality frame. And there's lots of those virtual reality frames for we individuated units of consciousness to explore and partake of. There's other games out there that we can log on to. So it's just a wider range of experience for us to grow up with. And that's, you know, kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah. So that's why that we can attach to these other things because we're consciousness and reality is data. Yeah, I love that. And something else, I, w I wrote this down, I want to sort of read, the, read off this because I didn't want to, this was a big question that I've been thinking about for a very long time in terms of what you've just been saying there about entering these different sort of altered states of consciousness and transcending our consciousness into these different sort of models of reality, so to say. Um, so a question I wanted to ask you is, what is actually going on when we are in these sort of visionary and altered states of consciousness and we do encounter different entities? And what I mean by that is because like myself, I've had very vivid lucid dreams where it's, it's clear to see that there is, there is other entities within there that can communicate with yourself. But it seems to me that they, within that realm, they are aware of you. They're always aware of you. Where for our, for our own personal experiences, we have to sort of 
alter our consciousness to be aware of them but it seems to be that there's intelligent entities within there that are always aware of us well <clears throat> that's because when you're in those other realities other than this one getting a data stream from uh or getting a data stream that is different than defining this virtual reality the the computer let us say it's the computer the larger conscious system is sending you data okay well it's aware of you and it can play all sorts of parts the data that it sends you could have 10 different characters in it the data that it's sending you is really about you and your experience your growth your learning and opening your mind to bigger things so it can play any number of characters in virtual reality gaming we call those npcs non-player characters it's something the computer just generates well a non-player character isn't really much different than a player it's just it's it's played by the computer if you will rather than some individuated unit of consciousness so that's the only difference so that's why these these other beings seem to know you I know what to do and interact with you, and they seem to be just the kind of interactions that you need to have an experience that helps you see a bigger picture and have a bigger picture. Sometimes they'll challenge you. Sometimes they'll scare you. Sometimes they do all sorts of things, but all of those things are give you choices. How are you going to react to that, you see? And those choices are the things that you're there for. So the system can give you as many characters as it likes. So it's not necessarily that those are independent beings out there that have free will life of their own. They're just in the data stream that you're getting. So they may be NPCs that, that the larger conscious system is putting in the data stream for you. Now, you also can interact with things that are much like us, other individuated units of consciousness. That's probably happens only in the margins. Um, you can interact with other people. You know, I have gone on an out-of-body experience with somebody else before. So the two of us were out there interacting with each other. That was something that Bob Monroe asked Dennis and I to do once at the lab. So, you know, go on experience and, and uh, stay together. Yeah. And we did, and we reported everything we saw. We had microphones that kind of were right in front of our mouths that we talk through the whole thing we had we were talking to each other um, we were pointing out we had a lot of varied things we experienced then and it was obvious that we were together seeing the same things experiencing the same things that we were having conversations of course we were isolated from each other you know he was in one booth and I was in another and these booths were acoustically isolated and they were probably about I don't know 30 feet apart separate rooms uh, electromagnetically shielded and acoustically isolated from each other. So you can do that with another IUOC, but most of the time you're getting a data stream just out of the larger consciousness system for your own growth. And most of the characters you'll see will be NPCs. Now, that doesn't mean that it has to be simple. Those, those NPCs and that story that you're getting in that out-of-body, you may go back to that 50 times a hundred times and the story may evolve it goes from this to that to the next thing and it can be a, a lengthy story you know you can it can be a book sort of thing not just a, a one-off occurrence well the system will develop that story and that book and the characters in it according to the interactions that you have according to how you make your choices will determine how that thing evolves so it's it's another VR. Yeah. yeah. Have you had an, an encounter when you have been doing experimental with out-of-body experiences? Um, have you had an, an encounter though where you have sort of not been able to sort of rationalize it and, and sort of it's been a case of where you've been had the experience you've met like sort of quote-unquote an intelligent entity or somebody else who is interacting with you and you've been in that situation and then try to sort of comprehend it and think, I just can't. It seems to be that there is something much larger at play that I can't comprehend. Have you had that? Yeah, sometimes, not too often anymore, more in the beginning, but the more experience you have, then the more easily you can comprehend what's going on. You know, when you're first new at anything, yeah. everything seems mysterious. 
right? Your first day at work on a new job, everything's mysterious because you just don't know how it works. But eventually you get to where you're kind of an old hand, you've been there a while, and then things are not quite so mysterious anymore. So I'd say that hasn't happened for a long time, but I have had situations where things have happened. I've had experiences, and I can't really place them as far as why. What did I have that for? What was in that to learn? And that's unusual. Typically, even if it takes me a week or two, if I think about it, I'll go, ah, that was the point. You know, that, that was the reason that I got that particular experience. And I can find something to learn in it. But then you should be able to find something to learn in everything. Yeah, definitely. Everything, you know, no matter what happens. You know, there's something to learn just from experience. So it's very rarely that there is nothing that I that I can learn from or that I can get out of it. Yeah, when, when you were sort of exploring the outer body realm now, what sort of things are you focusing your attention on now? Well, what I, what I force my attention on now is uh, trying to come up with better ways of explaining these things to people <laughs> so that they can actually understand them and, and uh, uh, so that they can, even though they don't have the experience, you know, most of your audience probably doesn't have the experience that you have had or that I have had. Yeah, and I'm try, not, I think they might have. <laughs> you, you, you try to explain to them, and it's very difficult yeah. if they haven't had the experience. Yeah. So I try to come up with better ways of communicating that um, now my life is a little different than it was. It used to be that, you know, I was me, and then there was this other reality. So I lived in this, what we call the physical reality, the physical universe, and then I would have experiences outside of it. But I'd be here, and then I would go into a meditation state or something, and then I would be there. But here and there were just two separate reality frames. You know? So they weren't really mixed. This is this reality, that's that reality, and they're not, they're not mixed much. But then over the years, that's kind of gone away. And now I just live in a reality that is, that is mixed. That's part of all of that. And I think that's probably the way it goes in time. If you keep going down this path, you end up living in a larger reality. You have a larger decision space. You interact with people differently. Another way of saying that is that I don't meditate anymore. My life's become a meditation. Wow, I like that. So I'm, I probably stay in that theta state most of the time. And when I talk to people, I'm constantly gathering information from other sources, uh, picking up connections and things that aren't here physically. Um, when you meet someone, you have a sense for where they are, where they're coming from, what their reality looks like so that you can communicate in a way that's meaningful to them. Because mm. if you don't share anything with them, then it's really hard to say something that they can take away, you know, that's useful. So you get that, you know, you might think on a side channel, but it's really just the whole thing. So I get the physical reality, but I get a little, a lot of data coming from the non-physical at the same time, and that's just my everyday space. So it's a, it's a little different. I, I guess sometimes it makes me a little absent-minded here because you can, you can only spread yourself but so thin. You know, if you're not focused in this reality, in, but maybe 10 or 20 percent, then you're kind of spacey here. You're not real. Um, I don't know. You're not real plugged in. Yeah. You're just partly plugged in. So you can juggle realities, but you've only got one, you've got 100%, but you could have 10% in this reality, 10% in that reality, you know, 30% in another reality, and then 50%, 50 in some other reality. And then you can do that if you can do, what was that, five things in parallel. That's a little difficult to run five things in parallel, but it isn't that hard to run two or three. That's pretty easy. So if you were to come to me and say, Tom, uh, my Aunt Susie uh, just fell down the steps and is really hurting. Could you tell me how bad is it? What's the prognosis? And could you help her out a little bit? From when you first said my Aunt Susie fell down the steps, I would be getting data about Aunt Susie and about her fall and what she hurt and how bad was it, what the prognosis was, and be giving her some healing while you were telling me the story because you can just parallel process 
those things. Wow. So you meet somebody new for the first time, you can get a sense of their feeling. You know, empaths do that all the time. They pick up other people's feelings. But this is a little more well-rounded than that. You pick up their feelings. You pick up kind of what their thoughts. You pick up on what their interests are, what they would like to get out of the conversation, how they're feeling. And that means you can then communicate with them and offer them information that's useful rather than just information that you know. And you're just saying, well, I don't know where you are, but here's where I am. So, you know, you download stuff to people and mostly people can't use that or a lot of it they can't use. It just kind of brushes right by because they can only connect to what they know with their experience. So I don't really go out of body or meditate or do those things. I just live in that space where it's automatic. So I don't, it's not that I say, oh, I want to get data about this person and their feelings. It just is there when I need it. So it's no longer a this space, that space. It's all just one whole organic thing that is the way it is. So you just live in a little bigger reality system than if it was just physical. Wow. That's such a multi-layered um, answer, by the way. And even when you were sort of transcending that across to me there, there was... Because sometimes when we have these conversations with different people, there's a part of me with inside myself that within a conversation itself, it's sometimes hard to really comprehend what somebody's saying. Somebody, sometimes somebody has to go back to a, a conversation multiple times because mm -hmm. conversations and words and languages are very multi-layered within every single thing that someone right. says. But for some reason, when you were telling me that there, I really got this unexplainable sense within me gut. I can't explain it but it was like an overwhelming sense, which will be interesting when I listen back to this podcast to see how I interpret, interpret it then. But it just felt to me that you were sort of, even when you were in saying that, people say certain things, but you weren't just saying it, you were completely embodying the whole sense of what that is. It, it, I don't know if you hate, I don't really, I don't know if you understand that, what I mean, but it just, I just felt, I just got this unbelievable overwhelming sense when you were transcending it. And just to change direction a little bit, a question that I wanted to ask you was on the sense of deja vu, because I've heard many rumors and of, I, I've myself in my own life, I have very a lot of encounters of deja vu. And as I've got a little bit older, they have sort of stopped as much. But in relation to, the, to your theories and consciousness and mm -hmm. the simulation theory, have you questioned deja vu and what that could be? Sure. And there's several things that it could be. It's not, you know, the reality is, is broad and deep and very complicated from the viewpoint of a person that is kind of stuck in physical reality. It's not really all that complicated otherwise, but there's, there's lots of different reasons why you might have deja vu. One of them may be that you, well, let me back up a little. The way we function with our minds is that we work with pattern recognition. So we look at something and we take that data and we check it against our history, all the patterns of things we've ever seen before. And when it's something that's familiar, like the face of your mother, you know, well, you recognize it exactly because that's a pattern you really know well. Um, if it's something that isn't exactly anything we've seen before, but it's real similar, it's close because of the context, because of the shapes, because of the colors, whatever. If it, if it matches, sort of matches something, then we have a sense of deja vu. Oh, I've seen this before. I'm connecting to it, but I can't really place it. That may be just because we get a partial pattern match that gives us that sense of I, I've been here, I've seen this, when we really haven't been there and we haven't seen it. So that's one thing. It's just a, a pattern matching thing. Another thing is it could be something out of your past. could be something that goes back to other times, other lifetimes, and something that was very significant to you, some place that, that just kind of resonates with you. It could be something like that, but that's less likely. Um, it could be something out of your future. It could be resonating with some probable future. So see, we have this probable future, not a done deal. It's just probable, and we have the past. And 
both of those are accessible to us as information. And we are, like I say, we're netted too, so all of that information. So we are actually processing all this information all the time. We're processing future probability, we're processing past, uh, and we're, we're interacting with each other. We're just not doing it at the intellectual level. That just all happens at a, at a deeper level than what we're aware of. Well, so it could be something out of the past, could be something out of the future that partially connects with a pattern, with something that's significant to us. So it could be any of those things. Um, it could be that there is just something about that place that, well, let me not go there. It could be that the experience of deja vu, particularly if it's a very strong deja vu, is just an eye-opener. It's just something that helps you wonder about whether there isn't more to this reality than just the physical. And the system does that a lot. It gives people kind of glimpses or experiences of a larger reality just to open their minds to the possibility. Um, you know, if you, if you get a thousand people together and you ask each one of them, has anything ever happened to you that was unexplainable? You know, something paranormal. Did you just get a message telepathically? Uh, you know, did you know when your children were having a problem? You know, a lot of ladies are very attached to their children psychically. So they know when Junior just fell down and got hurt immediately. So you ask people that and it finds out, it turns out about 75 to 85% say yes. So lots of people, not just a few, but lots of people have had these experiences of having their eyes open to a larger reality. And deja vu might just be one of those. So it could be that the system is just giving you something, giving you that sense of having been there before, seen that before, that uh, just open your mind. Or it may be somebody that uh, you particularly relate to, some, some event, some person even. Yeah. Sometimes you meet a person and it's like you've known them all your life. Right. You just that, they just feel that easy and that connected to them. And other times you meet people and you don't even want to get close. Yeah. You just <laughs> have this thing that's like just pushes you away. And even if you do get close, you shorten it as much as possible and you walk away because you have these information that you get out of databases. So that's not all, all of that wouldn't be called deja vu, but it's a very similar sort of thing. Yeah, all tied. So and it could be any one of those things that gives you that, that feeling. It's interesting because I really resonated with you when you said about how the universe or whatever you want to call it, whatever name you want to put on it, it gives you these sort of, these moments where, like you said, it, it's it's weird because I get these things where the universe sort of plays these trickster aspects as well. It was like even the sense of just to quickly go in, just to quickly touch on it, even the, the, the synchronicity of how we, me and you, had this conversation right now. The universe plays these little trickster aspects and one of them was that I actually had a, I was actually at a flight to go somewhere else. And um, for some reason or not, something told me, I can't even remember why, to check out your page to see where you are going to be, if you had any events coming up. And within a few days later, you were here at Lumley Castle, very close to my house. And for some reason, it's interesting how the game, the simulation or whatever you want to call it, puts these like sort of different chess moves in at different periods when you when you think you've already got your... your your direction mapped out of something that you're going to do and then all of a sudden it drops Tom Campbell in into the mix and says you're not doing this you're going to speak to Tom Campbell and I just think it's beautiful how the if you embrace them moments it's interesting how your course in life can be shifted just a little bit yes. different and it, it turns out that the more you go down this path the less you try to control the future many people are locked in this struggle with the future yeah. they want things to come out the way they want them. They want people to be the way they need them to be, you know, and they try to manipulate and change and arrange to have things come out the way they want to have it. That's trying to control 
what happens. And people feel that if they don't do that, then their life will just be chaos if they don't constantly try to keep everything in line. But as it turns out, just the opposite happens. When you give up trying to manipulate the future to be the way you want it, you find that everything that you need falls right at your feet just as you need it. Um, we call that synchronicity. Yeah. Things just happen as we need them. So if you're struggling to make things happen the way you want, and I should say the way you know is best and the way you think is right, then you're always frustrated. But if you stop that and just say, well, I'll just accept whatever happens as it happens and I'll deal with it, and that's good, then you'll find that the system now, the larger conscious system, can work with you a lot better that way because you haven't set up all these constraints. Now, if this interview would be a good thing you'd like to do, well, it just drops that right in front of you and then gives you a nudge to go find out about it. You know, and it works that way. So then you find out that when you try not to control anything, you find you don't need to control anything. Everything just works out perfectly that even if you had been the master of the universe and could control everything, you couldn't control it any better than what it is <laughs> if you just let it happen. So that's a very freeing thing that lets you let go of all the, the details in your life. And so it's okay, you know. People are people. They'll do what they need to do. You know, I'll do what I need to do, and life will just happen. And it does. Yeah. And it's very supporting. So that's just the nature of, of being conscious that we live in that kind of a system. But it's a neat thing. Yeah. I remember marveling at that when I first got that aha, you know. Now that I don't try to control anything, I don't need to control anything. I couldn't optimize it any better. Yeah, I love that. And just to sort of change direction of the podcast a bit as well, something I wanted to touch on was in the, in the regards to artificial intelligence. Do you think in the future that, because technology now, people are talking about how they are creating these artificial intelligence all over the world. Do you think it will be possible to actually evolve consciousness within inside artificial intelligence? Yes, absolutely. And it won't be all that long. And we've already done it to a very small degree. We already have been able to capture, say, the, the level of consciousness of, you know, say an insect, something like that. And I say that by the definition that if something makes a free will choice, if it makes a choice because it decides that's what it wants to do, then that thing is conscious. That's what, in my book, defines what's conscious and what's not. So a rock doesn't make choices. It doesn't choose to roll downhill. It rolls downhill because of something else, a force outside of itself. Um, a computer generally doesn't make any choices because it's programmed and it can only follow its programming. So that's algorithmic choices. It makes choices okay, but it only does that according to its algorithms, not according to its free will. But if we can make a computer that has free will choices, and by that it would have to make choices beyond an algorithm, beyond programming, and we can do that. We use neural networks and other such things to allow computers to learn. And we have no idea why they make the choices they make because that, that neural net is kind of self-changing. As it learns, as it has experience, it modifies its own programming. It changes little constants and numbers inside the computer. So eventually, it's something that we really don't understand and don't know exactly why it does what it does, but it seems to get better at it with experience. So that would begin to define a, a free will in that it can make choices that are non-algorithmic. Once you have that, and we already have that at, at simple degrees, then once those choices become interesting to an individuated unit of consciousness, well, that individuated unit of consciousness can log on and play that computer as an avatar. You see, then that computer is conscious just like we're conscious. It's just a different avatar. So if you're consciousness, you can play this carbon-based 
consciousness called a human being or a dog or a cat, or you could play that silicon-based consciousness. That's a computer. Yeah. Um, now, the two consciousnesses wouldn't be the same. You know, they'd be a bit different unless that conscious computer made the same kinds of choices that people made. Then it would develop a similar kind of consciousness that people have if it had that capacity, you know, enough storage, enough speed, you know, enough basic ability to do that. So, yes, we will see conscious computers. And that computer, you know, if we, if we put it into uh, religious terms where your consciousness is your soul, then that computer has a soul just like you know, a human would because if you smash that computer, the consciousness survives because it was just logged on. So the computer is an avatar. So it's no different really than us, just the choice of a different avatar. Now, on the other hand, you can have expert systems. Expert systems, which you also called AI, are algorithmic. They have very fast processors and lots of data. So they can act very human-like, but they're not conscious. They're just following algorithms. So there might be, a, um, say, a robot, and he could reach out and pick up one of these roses and sniff it and put it back in and go, ah, that's a, and read off the Latin name, because he's got sensors, olfactory sensors in his nose that look at the, you know, the biochemistry and what he gets in that sensor, isolates that as being a particular rose, and then maybe has some typical common comments to say after he sniffs. Yeah. But all that's looked up. And if his database is really good and his computer process is really fast, he can do that just in real time. It might seem very natural. So you could have a computer that acted very human, but was really just a very highly evolved expert system. Just data. Yeah. And, and uh, all of his choices were algorithmic. No free will. Okay, now that will never be conscious because consciousness requires free will. So that might, we say, would emulate consciousness. Yes. Uh, well. There. That might emulate consciousness, but it wouldn't be consciousness. We may not be able to tell whether it was conscious or not, so it might pass the Turing test, but still wouldn't be conscious. It would just be very clever, very fast, and have a lot of data. Uh, so if a computer is conscious, it's because an individuated unit of consciousness has logged onto it as an avatar. And now again, the consciousness is making all the choices. Yeah. See, with the expert system, the expert system's making choices based on its, you know, if-then statements that are in the computer. So those are kind of two branches of AI, one uh, is going to be conscious and evolve just like us. It will have feelings, it will have attitudes. Um, and the other would never have feelings or attitudes. So that even though it could smell the rose, it's not going to feel anything particularly about that. All it has is data. It may go back in memory and say, oh, I smelled a similar rose you know, 20 years ago in a similar situation. But it's, there's no feeling involved in that. It's just a computation of data. Everything's facts, not feelings. What do you think the implications of that will be on society? Because <clears throat> let's say, if, like you said, it could be possible to evolve consciousness into a sort of an, an artificial intelligence. Could that artificial intelligence, because I keep thinking sometimes in my head that, like we were talking about before, the trickster aspect of the universe and the way the universe plays, it puts these different things in, in front of your path. Because the question I keep asking myself is like, is technology a means for understanding the nature of reality? Is technology a means for understanding that what what this is, what this life is? And I don't, I mean, that, maybe that's a question for you on top of that. Yeah. Is technology a means for understanding the sure. nature of reality? Sure, it is. Everything... Everything is a means for helping us understand the nature of reality. A walk in an old forest, you know, just, you know, watching a waterfall, listening to the water, and so on. All of that is a means for us to have a bigger picture and understanding. But technology gave us the double slit experiment. 
which has told science that this is not a physical reality. Yeah. See, it's on the way to, uh, to a bigger picture. So sure, science and technology are part of our experience. And that science and technology gives us different choices, different ideas, different concepts. It, uh, you know, we have, we have like cell phones. They've affected life tremendously. Life doesn't go on the same as it used to because of that. It changes us. It changes the way we think, changes us how we see ourselves, how we see other people. Um, you know, it's got its good points. It's got its bad points. You can see a lot of people sitting around and every one of them is staring at their cell phone and they're not talking to each other. Yeah. On the other hand, they have this much wider community and they're sending pictures back to their friends and everybody else about where they are and what they're doing. So they're communicating but it's not in the old-fashioned way that people are used to communicating. It doesn't mean it's better or worse. It just means it's different. And when things are different, it gives us different choices. And when we have different choices, well, there's a new way that we can choose to evolve or de-evolve yeah. by the quality of that choice. So, sure, technology is just part of our mix. It's part of our environment. It's part of our reality. Yeah. Do you think, like, in sense of, like, see if you have an artificial intelligence, because we have this point in our minds where, I mean, I, I think it was, is it Ray Kurzweil? I think it's, I'm sure it's Ray Kurzweil, or off, off, I think it might have been Arthur C. Clarke, where he talks about when machines do get to the point where they are conscious, even in our minds there is a black spot to understanding what is their capabilities and what is their understanding. And I think sometimes when we think about artificial intelligence, we always use our we use our own human sort of um, sure. uh, abilities to think of the bigger questions of the, even in terms of the nature of reality. But I keep thinking what could be the possibilities of an uh, artificial intelligence that is highly more intelligent than us and we can't even comprehend what, sure. would, what could they un uncover? Yeah. That's possible. Yeah. And the reason is that what our biology does is sets constraints on what the consciousness can do with this avatar. See, that's the biology represents the rule set. I said this reality evolved. It didn't get programmed. Well, that evolution, that rule set with those initial conditions ended up evolving all of this. And our biology is a result of that evolution. So it represents the rule set. It represents the possibilities that the rule set allows. Okay, but there are constraints there too. There's only so much we can do. You know, we can't jump. 10 feet in the air. We can't learn, you know, arithmetic and then algebra and then, you know, uh, calculus and then differential equations all in an afternoon. We can't process that much. We can't, we can't synthesize those ideas that quickly. It takes time to get our, those kind of concepts to where we understand them. We just can't do it. We're not, we have limitations based upon our biology, based upon the rule set. Do you, do you think, sorry to jump in, but I just don't want to forget this point. Do you think our biology actually could actually suppress us from asking bigger questions? Because what I mean by that is, is ever since in, in a lot of a lot of people who I've spoke to who listen to this podcast and a lot of my close friends who are having these deep conversations, we have these moments in your life. And I mean, you probably can um, sort of relate to this as well, is where you think everyone's sit, like on a night time. I have these when I'm in my bedroom and I'm just sitting on a night time and I'm just sort of questioning all the biggest questions about the universe. There is a point within the human mind where you go to, where you start questioning what if, what if, what if, what is this, what is this? And something comes up like a limitation in the back of your mind. It stops you from getting to a certain point, if you can relate to that. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the, the nature of this reality puts does that on purpose for the purpose of what we're in now? Well, we, like I say, we only can work to the capacity that our biology gives us, okay? We can only think so much, go so deep, and we can only understand things to the extent that our experience allows us to understand it. And as you keep asking what ifs and what ifs, and pretty soon you feel like you just don't, you're not standing on solid ground anymore, you know? <laughs> you don't believe anything that you're thinking because there's no real basis for it. That's because you've gone beyond what your experience knows. Your experience can't support any of that. And if your experience can't support it, it's called conjecture. 
You're just making it up. And you know that if you have conjecture piled upon conjecture, there's not a whole lot of, of uh, fact in that. It's just conjecture. And you should take it only lightly, not too seriously. In other words, you don't invest too much in, in conjecture. So we have these limitations of our biology. Yes, we just can't go any further because we don't have the experience or we just need more time to process that information, more experience, more understanding, and we can't do it any faster, you know? So you understand things more now than you did 10 years ago yeah. because you've collected more experience, you've thought about things, your ability to think about these things. When you, when you learn something, you have to learn the basics first, and then you learn the next thing. You know, you have to learn to, to count first, and then you can maybe learn arithmetic, and then you learn maybe algebra, and then you, you know, you can't learn all of them at once. It does keep turning around. Yeah, it's, just this, it's just the nature of the simulation. <laughs> <laughs> it just keeps rotating for some reason. Anyway, so you have those constraints, and those are constraints of, your, of the rule set. So we could, com we could uh, produce a computer, and let's say that computer had neural nets or some, what the decades from now equivalent is to that, uh, that allows it to have free will. And it may have more processing power, and it may have more uh, memory than us. And it may, one day, if we can build that big enough and fast enough, or whatever. Now, the whole, the, this computer may not sit in the head of a skull of a robot. This computer may take up a computer room. You know, who knows? But it may be a lot smarter than we are just because it can think faster and process faster. But it can't get experience any faster. Experiences, you got to experience it, right? And somebody else's experience, even if they describe it to you, is not your experience. And you can read all the books that all sorts of things that people experience, and you get that as knowledge, facts, that other people had it, but it is not the same as you experience it. If, if it's not your experience, it's not your truth. If it's somebody else's experience, it's their truth. You may know about it, but it's not your truth. So this computer is only going to experience things as it experiences things. <laughs> we need some microphone stands. Yeah, we need a microphone stabilizer. We used to have the microphone stands, but uh, what what happened was is they were sort of they were just too close on people's faces, and no one could see the see yeah. the ca camera angle. So anyway, that's the that will be the weak spot. Yes, it can process faster. It can remember more. It can count a whole lot faster, but it's not going to have experience. And without experience, you are very limited into what your truth is and what you can understand. You have to have some experience, which is one of the reasons I tell people in my books, don't believe anything I say. You have to go experience it because if you don't experience it, it's not your truth. It'll just be a, somebody else's idea, somebody else's theory. Now you can decide to believe it or not believe it, but neither one of those hold any power for you. That doesn't give you any knowledge. So belief is not a good thing. You just have to say, well, I don't know, so let me try to get some of that experience. You know? Let me try to find out. So the, the computer will have a capacity, perhaps, to process more than we can process and to do that faster, but how is it going to get experience? Well, it depends on the kind of experience we're talking about. Let's say we have this, this uh, conscious computer, and what it's doing is um, monitoring and optimizing the electrical grid, as well as, the, as, well as the, uh, say all the communications going on. Okay, so it may be doing hundreds of thousands, millions of things. And its experience would be the choices it has to make to keep the electrical grid, say, you know, in the whole country, say in the United States, you know, it needs to keep that electrical grid optimized for everybody. And that would take lots and lots of choices and very, very fast. So we would have deep experience in electrical grids and perhaps communications and, and uh, 
optimizing the use of satellites and uplinks and downlinks and all that sort of thing. It would make our world much more efficient. But what is that computer going to know about love? What is that computer going to know about caring and friendship? And they're the questions. Not by doing that, you see. Well, if that's a conscious computer, it needs to talk to people. It needs to interact. It needs to get personal. It needs to, you know, have friends. Yeah. And then it would learn those kinds of things. But in our reality, that's going to be a little difficult for it. You see, nobody wants to sit and hold hands over coffee, you know, with a computer. So Some people might. <laughs> some people might, right. But that's going to be a little, a little difficult. So it's going to be very limited in how it can develop in certain areas. So it may always just be something that is really good at managing lots of facts and stuff. Yeah but never really very good at holding a conversation yeah. or caring about somebody else. But it doesn't mean it doesn't have that capacity. Just turn that on. Don't worry. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> get to the microphones. It does. It's just, it's just, it's just a stern microphone, right? I think, I think next time what I'm going to do for the <laughs> conversation is I'm going to get a new microphone stand here so that the... Yeah. So that we don't, no one has to touch them. They just <laughs> don't have to worry about them. Yeah. But it's something else I qu quickly want to touch on with you as well was um, Elon Musk is um, when more people have been talking about the theory of the simulation theory and people's mm -hmm. been coming out and seeing that it is possible. We had a few. There was a a lot of uh, tension on people like Elon Musk and other people were coming forward and saying that now we know it's a simulation. We're going to try and figure out how we can get out of the simulation. I don't know if you heard statements like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, is it, could it be possible to do that? And is it possible to actually change the rule set? It's not very likely you're going to change the rule set. The rule set is what evolved to, to give us this, this physical universe, which is a virtual reality. You're not going to change that because that is necessary for this reality to exist. So you're not going to do much with that. Now you can bend the rules some, perhaps. You can perhaps make some new rules that you could add to it. You can certainly get out of this reality. And we've talked about that earlier. All you have to do is connect to another data stream and you're out of this reality. Yeah, and there's lots of these different uh, realities around that you can visit. There's other realities like this one that is, has a very um, strong rule set. Lots of rules, therefore it seems physical. See, the rules give everything, uh, like, what's the word? Um, Put everything's in context and gives everything, um, uh, the words jumped out of my mind now, um, chain, you know, what's a causal chain? Gives everything causality. Yeah, causality. That's the word that jumped out of my mind. Yeah. It gives everything causality because you have so many rules that the reason this is that way is because of the rules. And before you can get this way, you have to be that way. And if you're that way, then you can change to this. And from here, you can change to that. But it's all within the rule set. So the rule sets define causality. So if you have a real tight rule set, then you have a real tight causality. And that's what we call a physical place. Yeah. But there's dozens of these. This one that we live in that we call our physical universe, that's just one. So, yeah, there's lots of other realities you can go play in if you want to call that hacking the system or giving it out of it. But you do that by picking up another rule set with your consciousness, yeah. not by something that you do to break the structure of what you're in. See, that only is a concept if you believe this is all physical-based. If you think it's all physical-based, then somehow you have to get out into the network. But... You're already in that network. Your consciousness. Yeah. You are the network. Yeah. You see. <laughs> well, maybe we should use tape. So I'm just yeah. tape this to my <laughs> hand. Uh, you are the network. Yeah. Your consciousness. Consciousness is the computer. You have access to the computer. You don't have to hack it. You're already there. So in that sense, yes, you can get out of here and and do other things but only as consciousness and only within the larger consciousness system. There's no need to hack it. You're not trapped in this. You just logged on to this, and it's the only experience that you're aware of. Therefore, you identify as being in there, but you're not trapped in it at all. You're not in it. It's a virtual reality. So that's sort of the answer to that. They just don't understand 
what virtu- what it, what it means to be a virtual reality. They don't understand the consciousness connection. They keep it at a it's all physical. Therefore, they have to physically do something to you know break into the system. They're already they're already not here. They just believe they're here. They're really consciousness. I love that. Would you do you just to bring sort of one more question? I want to ask you because obviously I want to respect the time as well. But just the last question I want to sort of uh, bring to you was: Would you are you would you say you're at a point in your life now where you have the whole sort of map of reality sort of mapped out in your own mind? And if not, what other questions are you sort of asking yourself now in your life? Yeah. Well, I started the the book, My Big Toe, three books there, and I, I started those in 2003 in February. So it's just in the very beginning of 2003. Since then, I've learned all sorts of things. Actually, those two books had been out for a year or two before I realized that the same concepts that explain consciousness, because they really get where a model of consciousness before I, I realized that uh, they also explain physics. And uh, I could derive physics from consciousness, which I knew should have been able to be done, but I really didn't know how to approach it, how to do that. And then I could understand quantum mechanics, I understand relativity from that viewpoint of virtual reality and things that are paradoxes now to physicists. They just don't get them. They don't understand them. Like, why is this be the light of constant? Why should particles be probability distributions? All become real, logical, rational ideas when you see it from a virtual reality perspective. So then science kind of came into it. And then I started looking for paradoxes in other fields. And those kind of fell out too. A lot of things that, um, you know, theologians study, you know, what's the... What's the big picture? And then they, all that stuff kind of falls out of it as well. So I've been in the process of looking for things that don't fit the theory. In other words, if there's something that's out there that's fundamentally a part of somebody's experience, somewhere that they can go or be or, or even in their own mind, uh, something that is, that is subjective that they've experienced and it doesn't fit the model, then I'm interested in that. I'm looking for things that don't fit. And when they don't fit, then I'll try to fit them and say, well, can my model explain this? And if I can't, then that means my model is not complete. So I need to change it or adjust it or expand it. And if it still doesn't work, I have to get rid of it and try something else. So models aren't done deals. Models are just a way of looking at the world. It's a way to interpret the data. It's a way to interpret your experience. So scientists do experiments, and then they need a model to interpret that experiment. So far, the model has been materialism, and it's done a pretty good job until we got to quantum mechanics, and then it does a terrible job. It can't explain that, and it can't explain why C is a constant. There's a lot of things now, a lot of experiments that just can't be explained, and just writing it off as weird science is not you know, acceptable. You have to explain it. Well, virtual reality concepts do explain it. Those things just fall out as reasonable, logical things that couldn't be any other way than they are from that viewpoint. So you want to look at the things that don't fit. And I've been doing that um, well since I wrote the books, basically looking for things that don't fit. And so far, all of them have fit. All the things that people bring up, sometimes people will send me stuff in emails and other, here's something that doesn't fit. And I look at it and I find that so far it does fit. Or I've expanded the model a little bit to cover this or to cover that. So, yes, I'm constantly looking for things that don't fit. Yeah, I love that. Because that's how your model grows. You know, it's not like this is model and, you know, I, you know, I found it etched in stone next to a burning bush, you know, and it's the word of, you know, the maker or something. It isn't like that. It's just a model. And as long as it describes our experience, then it's a good model. Where it stops describing our experience, then it's not such a good model. So we, you know, need to do further work. So I don't think that, you know, my job's done with it. I've just taken it this far and maybe I'll expand it in the future more. 
I've been expanding it since it was published. You know, it's, I've added a lot of the science to it, but I expect I'll expand it more in the future. And then it's just a model that's out there. Every, anybody else can take it up and expand it. You know, I've just kind of thrown it out and saying, hey, if this, if this model, if this model uh, works for you, if it explains your experience, it explains your world, whether you're a scientist or, or a theologian or, you know, a psychologist or whatever, then use it. And if it doesn't, well, let's make it better. Yeah, I love that. Well, that's probably a good place to end it as well. And thank you so much, honestly, Tom. Thank you so much for giving us, your, giving us me, giving me your time. Honestly, it's an absolute pleasure to have a conversation with you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Except for this microphone. Yeah, you except turn for, it around in my hand. That's... Except for the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's been good. I've enjoyed it too. I mean, the whole point is to help people understand a bigger picture. But it has to be their bigger picture. You know, if they believe my bigger picture, that'll take them maybe a little bit of distance just because it's a model for them to hang their experience on. But it really has to be their model, it has to be their big toe, not just my big toe. And if, if it's a belief, that's not really helpful to them as individuals. So that's the point. It's why we do these talks, right? To yeah, help other people find their own bigger picture. That's the whole point of it. Mm-hmm.